Hi, everyone. Um, well, yeah, welcome to the session on COVID-19. Um, we've already heard yesterday from Aviv and Sarah that the work on the HCA community has, has actually really already um, been an excellent showcase how the human cell atlas has utility uh, for studying disease and in this case COVID in particular. And I'm delighted today to be able to introduce to you three great speakers who've worked on this. And actually all three of them come from very different parts of the world. Um, our first speaker is Professor Alex Siegel. And um, Alex is a member of faculty at the Africa Health Research Institute and also at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And he's based at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. And he will tell us about evolution and persistence of SARS-CoV-2 in the face of immune pressure. Over to you, Alex. Uh, thank you. So uh, the talk title is a little different, uh, if you can see it. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't, I think, really matter. Um, so first of all, thank you to uh, uh, Musum Schlanga and to Alex Shalik for, for inviting me. It's, 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 uh, it's great to present here. Uh, my talk will be a little bit, I think, different uh, than, than what usually is done in the Human Cell Atlas, but perhaps it, it builds on Partha's uh, point of heterogeneity in disease. And I think what you are gonna be seeing or at least what I'm seeing, is heterogeneity uh, in the actual virus, in SARS-CoV-2. So the, the, the title of the talk uh, is uh, Moving Target uh, Interactions of uh, HIV uh, and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and uh, what uh, uh, I'll be talking about is basically a couple of points. Uh, one is that... Uh, uh, COVID-19 disease severity in people living with HIV is influenced by the infecting variant, and uh, advanced HIV disease may delay SARS-CoV clearance and lead to intra-host evolution of apparent adaptations uh, found in variants of concern. So the first bit, so this I think has become quite familiar here in this blue circle, you're seeing a variant come up, in this case is the uh, beta, beta variant first discovered in South Africa by Tio de Oliveira. Uh, it's, a, it's a variant that's an escape variant as opposed to a transmission variant like the, the current kind of uh, circulating Delta variant. And it has a bunch of mutations like the uh, E484K, which, which kind of mediate that uh, in the spike uh, uh, region uh, of, of the protein. Um, so, um, Sandile Tlele, um, and uh, uh, myself, we're kind of uh, got this, this variant back in, in, in November and we're trying to uh, um, outgrow it, which would turn out to be uh, uh, quite difficult, but, but apparently possible. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, figured out kind of a strategy where, where this guy could, uh, 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 could be outgrown and this had to involve a human cell line somewhere uh, upstream, then uh, infecting cell to cell, uh, uh, Vero E6 cells, which are the standard cell lines. So this, this variant was somewhat different than our previous experience with the virus, which involved, uh, uh, you know, very easy outgrowth in just the, you know, the monkey cell line. Um, so uh, uh, once we got that, um, we put it through our assay, and this is basically called a, a live virus neutralization assay. And what it is, is basically you add the antibody or convalescent plasma uh, to the uh, to the virus, uh, put it on top of some uh, very sick cells and put a, a bunch of uh, gel on top of that, so that uh, the infection doesn't spread. And you see these foci of localized infection. You count them and see what's going on. And I think to our our shock, uh, uh, this variant, which was used to be called Fabo one YB two, it had other names. Um, so the 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 virus we had previously, which only had the D. 614G mutation could be cleared by convalescent plasma, at least this participant, that's what you see in the first row, as you get to higher concentrations of the plasma. But the, uh, uh, the variant, the beta variant, uh, could not, uh, or not as well. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, Sandile, his name is pronounced with a click, uh, uh, um, kind of led this work. And what we found is that uh, it increases the uh, neutralization about tenfold uh, with uh, uh, of plasma from 
people who were infected with previous uh, uh, strains of SARS-CoV-2. And this was kind of uh, uh, very close to what another group in South Africa, that of Penny Moore, also found. And we're kind of calling each other and saying, uh, could you believe this? Uh, but apparently it was right. Um, and, but the virus had kind of has other ways of, uh, of escaping antibodies. And uh, uh, this is one of them. So these are cells infected uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. There are human cell line, H199. What you're seeing there in the middle is this incitium being formed. And, and if I just run this other movie, which is the control cells, you'll see that you know these cells grow and divide, but they don't form such uh, uh, crazy structures. And if you uh, look at the fluorescent images of the nuclei, uh, which I just not, don't have time to show, um, it's, it, they're very, very organized. Um, so there's other changes uh, that can go on with these variants. And one of them is actually, uh, you know, changes in other uh, SARS-CoV-2 genes that give uh, resistance to interferon. This was found for the beta variant, for the alpha variant, and it's probably gonna be found for some more variants. Um, and so these things are, are, are somewhat different than the original virus. Um, and uh, kind of going back, uh, we have a cohort running, a longitudinal cohort looking at people who were infected with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 over time and, and monitoring their symptoms. And at the, uh, uh, in the first wave of infection, which had the kind of the, the ancestral variants, we found that people uh, uh, living with HIV really did not differ in any parameters that relative to people who were HIV negative. But with the second wave of infection in South Africa, which were beta variant, we actually found that this changed completely and that people uh, uh, living with HIV required much more supplemental oxygen. Yeah, interestingly, this is not, did not really happen in HIV negative uh, people. So, um, you know, this, this thing is kind of a surprise and we're hoping kind of to put this data out now because, you know, next, next wave, something different may happen uh, again, right? Um, so uh, just looking more closely at these people, they tend to have uh, low CD4 count, just not everybody. So this is kind of disease severity, one to three scale with three is more severe. Uh, most people with low CD4, uh, lower than 200 have severe disease but it doesn't really uh, get cut uh, on the HIV status. So if you're viremic that, uh, for HIV, it doesn't mean you're gonna get more severe disease. You have to have the low CD4 count. But if you look at who is actually in this, pop, uh, in this uh, uh, population of low or subgroup of low CD4, um, if you compare it to the, uh, the total cohort, we have about 40% people living with HIV. But if you look at the total proportion of people with low CD4, not surprisingly, it's overwhelming majority, either HIV viremic or uh, HIV suppressed with antiretroviral therapy. Uh, surprisingly, in the higher disease severity, the people who actually get the most sick are actually those on, uh, on antiretroviral therapy. We don't know exactly why, why that is, and we're kind of uh, looking at that. Okay, so the second bit, is advanced HIV disease may delay SARS-CoV-2 clearance and lead to intra-host evolution of apparent adaptations. Found them very concerned. This is a close collaboration here with Atula de Oliveira and Richard Lessels uh, that are kind of working in the same building as us in, in Durban, South Africa. Um, so we follow this participant. Most of this is kind of retrospective. So we didn't know this was going on at the time. Um, that uh, uh, basically did not clear SARS-CoV-2. So the CT, which is a reciprocal of the, of the viral load uh, in the upper respiratory tract, um, is, is very low. So it means a lot of virus. Uh, and this virus just keeps going and going and going uh, for six months. And if you look at uh, who this person is, or at least at, at the immune parameters, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, um, HIV uh, virus in, in uh, a lot of viremia and a very, very low CD4 count, single digits. Once we kind of got onto this uh, uh, participant, uh, we, we switched the uh, ARTS uh, regimen to dolutegravir and things improved quite a bit and the participant cleared uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, sorry, it, it first the HIV got under control and then the participant uh, cleared uh, SARS-CoV-2. So it looks something like this, uh, where these things were related. 
But once the HIV problem was uh, controlled, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 was cleared. Um, if you look at what happened in this participant kind of over time at these dif different time points, you really see something that, that you see in HIV, which is a quasi-species. So there are different uh, sub-variants. Uh, uh, there are uh, kind of uh, a different genomes circulating together. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of them are... Right. Uh, so some of them are uh, uh, very, uh, look like a mutation of various of concern. And this is kind of just the last slide. So we outgrew these things and they didn't outgrow like the major, they didn't, they're not necessarily the major variants in, in, in this person, but there are some of the quasi species. And we found this virus compared to the original virus in this person actually evolved resistance to neutralization. And this resistance was highest if you compare, the difference was highest if you compare the original virus to the most evolved virus. So just to conclude, uh, more severe disease uh, seems to be, be, in people living with HIV, is beta variant uh, associated. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 evolved similar mutations in variants of concerns in a participant with advanced HIV. Evolved mutations lead to escape from neutralization. Uh, control of HIV uh, with ART may be key to preventing evolution of SARS-CoV-2. And lastly, I think, and, and this is kind of what's kind of striking me now, is that SARS-CoV-2 biology may change between variants and within one person uh, if uh, infection uh, persists. Okay, thank you. Kirsten, you're muted. Thank you very much for that uh, fantastic talk, Alex. Um, and um, I, th I think it really um, uh, speaks to the, this evolution of um, viral variants and people who have problems in clearing the virus really speaks to this fact that we aren't going to be safe till everybody is safe around the whole world. So, um, you know, that that's um, really good. I'm just looking for questions um, in the chat. Um, but until people have put something there, can I just ask, you talked about the syncytia that you observe um, in your tissue culture. Are those also observed in vivo? Absolutely, yeah. So the virus loves doing this. Um, and uh, you see them as a, as a hallmark of, of infection in the lung of, of people who have uh, succumbed to, to uh, COVID uh, disease. Um, now, it, it seems like the variants... Uh, uh, different variants uh, do different degrees of, of this stuff or may kind of have alternative strategies compared to each other in how they infect cells and perhaps even the cell type might be different. Great. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I think as there are no um, other questions from the audience at the moment, we will move on to the next speaker. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ziming Zhang. He's professor of um, uh, at Peking University and a principal, a principal investigator at Biopic and Beijing Advanced Innovation Center for Genomics in China. And he's had a, a very distinguished career in um, uh, computational cancer biology and cancer genomics. And during the pandemic, he's now um, used his skills and applied them to COVID. And the title of his talk is understanding the tumor immunology and COVID-19 at the single cell level. Over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, it is a great honor uh, uh, to have this opportunity to present our work. The title I pre uh, provided early on include the tumor immunology because that's something we usually work on. Uh, but since this is put in the COVID-19 session, obviously I'll spend more time in the COVID-19. But before I do that, I just want to spend just a, maybe a few uh, slides to show what we are typically working on, which uh, is also the reason that brought us to the COVID-19 uh, study. So um, we usually study the complexity of the tumor microenvironment, which is uh, essentially a, a composite of all, all kinds of different cells. And uh, what we typically do is to study the uh, composition of the tumor microenvironment to study what are the special cells that are inside the tumor and what are, do we have any special options, where, what are the dynamics of the cells, what are the cell interactions like, how are they related to clinical relevance. So just to give a couple examples of what we are working on. So this is a couple of papers we, uh, uh, oops, okay. I don't know why we keep on going back, okay. 
Um, so, so this, I don't know why it's going, um, going back to the original set. Okay, all right. Okay, so now is it better? Okay. Um, so this is a um, um, study uh, that we studied the infiltrating uh, myeloid cells in the uh, liver tumor. From this, we identified a tumor-enriched dendritic cell that we call M3DC. And from the uh, colorectal cancer, we identified uh, some subsets of microglia cells uh, that are simply being enriched in tumor. We call those uh, uh, TAMs. There are two subsets of TAMs with distinct features. Since those are found in uh, different uh, tumor types, we ask the question if this uh, cell types are tumor specific or universal to answer this, we essentially performed a pan cancer analysis of infiltrating immune cells, where we took all the published data sets from the literature and tried to integrate those together from the, from the cancer types that are not, not already uh, represented. We would generate new data uh, for those uh, cancer types. For each of the cancer types, we would do the immune cell characterization and repeat this process from all the cancer types we have covered. And from those, we can identify that some of the cancer subtypes, for example, lem 3 dc is universally present across all cancer types. And uh, this is also true for the CMPC hands. But the SPD1 macrophage, for example, are uniquely present in some of the cancer types, but not other. From those, we can um, compare the similarity of different uh, cancer types. For, uh, so some of the uh, immune cell types would seem to be universal and consistent. Some others are show a lot of variation across the cancer types. And we can also study, identify, again, new uh, immune subtypes uh, that have very distinct feature from those of the known uh, uh, cell types. So I'm not gonna go through the details since it's a COVID-19 uh, uh, talk. Um, but the key point is that by studying all those immune cells, um, we can understand the differences between different cancer types. And from a technical point of view, what we did was to take all those published data sets together and we supplement this with newly generated single cell data. We performed the, the, the data integration to generate uh, the, the major, uh, the pan-cancer myeloid cell atlas across cancer types. So with that in mind, we we'll say, so COVID-19 happened. Okay, then what happened? Um, then uh, um, the COVID-19, even though we don't typically study the virus, the, uh, the symptoms caused by COVID-19 are deeply related to immune properties. In fact, most of the symptoms are probably related to uh, uh, immune disorders, at least in a severe stage. So we actually need to understand uh, uh, the immune properties within the COVID-19 patients. And um, when the uh, COVID-19 erupted uh, last year in China, and uh, different groups across the country started to perform single cell data uh, for, uh, from the, um, uh, for the samples collected from COVID-19 patients, uh, and some of the data are already published, what we found was that typically each study is actually very small. Usually you, you have uh, maybe five or six samples to somewhere in the order of maybe 20 samples per study. And even though the data published, some of the results are inconsistent and sometimes the results are not robust. So I figure, well, maybe is there a way we can uh, let uh, us, the different labs, to, uh, to essentially uh, contribute their data uh, together to a unified place where we can perform more of a, a mega analysis. And we also generate a new data to supplement this data set. And we end up contacting close to 30 laboratories and close to 20 of them. Uh, really uh, willing and uh, really uh, motivated to contribute that raw data to us. And then um, with that data, we essentially um, um, took all those data. Uh, we used the, um, the unified data processing pipeline from the raw data and we use exactly the same QC uh, to uh, filter those data. And just uh, uh, add a, a couple of key points. Then uh, for such a large data set, as we found that Callisto uh, plus uh, a bus tool package worked out the best for such a such large data sets. Anyways, we use Harmony, Harmony for uh, data normalization. So at the end, we end up uh, uh, generating data for 284 samples for close to 200 individuals and with a total of uh, uh, 1.5 million uh, single cell data, this is after filtering 
So with this such data, we can actually uh, uh, have, uh, we can generate the uh, detailed uh, immune cell type annotation in a consistent fashion. For example, for, for T cell, there are more than a dozen cell types to each major compartment. And we can repeat this for all the other compartments. There are also epithelial cells as well. So with all this data, so let's uh, perform some analysis. So uh, as expected, some of uh, the <laughs> epithelials obviously are in enriched in bulk or those kind of fluid from, uh, from lung and those proliferative uh, uh, plasma B cell and T cell and T cells are enriched in the, in the bulk as well. And, and also um, we can try to figure out if, um, if there is a general trend in terms of elevation or decrease of the major uh, immune compartments or specific immune subtypes. Uh, for example, you can see there is general decrease of the T cells in the blood and there is a general increase of B cells, uh, but you know, maybe an uh, increase in microcarocytes in the severe patient, but not in other patients. But if you look at the subtype level, even though there is a general decrease of the T cell compartment, there is an increase of the proliferative CD4 and CD8 T cells in the blood in the uh, severe patients. Okay. And also with such a data, you can, you can perform uh, more robust statistical analysis to see um, if for some for risky population, if there are some special features of the immune cell types. So um, based on the essential ANOVA analysis, you can tell that the B cells are increased during the uh, covalescent stage. And um, in the aged patients, uh, that uh, tend to be a decrease of neutrophils and naive CD8 T cells, which probably explains why those uh, individuals are at a, uh, in a more risky uh, group. And in a severe patient, there, uh, has, uh, there, there is a tend to be a decrease of the mate cells and gamma, gamma delta T cells. And uh, females tend to have a higher level of effective T cells. Now, um, we, with such data, obviously, of course, with such a large data set, you can uh, perform a series of findings. But here, I just want to maybe focus on one aspect of the finding. And if you take uh, the immune cells, you, you ask the question, can we detect a viral signals? Uh, the, uh, 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 namely the SARS-CoV-2 uh, 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 RNA sequences, of course you can detect such viral sequencing in epithelial cells, okay? But surprisingly, uh, we actually detect viral signals in um, some other uh, cell types here. So if you take all the virus positive cells here, to say what, what are the cells that has a virus signal, you see um, different types of uh, epithelial cells, but uh, surprisingly, neutral fields, macrophage cell, TNK cells, plasma cells. And the viral count is actually very uh, high. And those are probably at least at the same level as those in the epithelial cells. So those are not a contamination product of any, of any sort. And those are likely not the byproduct of like a doublet or something, because you have a doublet, you have features that resembles both epithelial cells and immune cells. So here we take those cells and, we, and use the uh, different um, uh, marker genes for different immune cell types can see that the uh, typically the, the features are actually fairly strong. Okay, so we definitely see the strong virus uh, sequences in those immune cells, but the, does the detection of the immune cells really mean infection? We're not really sure, but let's examine a few different aspects uh, to uh, answer this question. The, the first aspect is that do we, do we observe increased level of of um, interferon stimulating genes. And this is typically observed in uh, a viral infected cells. And typically, as you can see, this cell tend to exhibit a higher level of IFIT1, 2, 3, and multiple other such IFIT genes here, okay? And those genes are not just uh, highly present in these cells, um, but if you compare the cells with those virus negative corresponding cell types, the, so the virus positive cell always, always express high level of such interferon stimulating genes. So indicating possibly maybe such expression is related to the viral uh, 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 present or infection. So we cannot uh, really detect a viral infection. But so the other, the other thing is that if you, um, so the SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope positive sense single strand RNA virus. That really means, so for most of the coronavirus, they are typically characterized by subgenomic transcription. Name, that really means is that you tend to describe more uh, transcription at the three prime end of the genome. And this is true for epithelial cells, as you can see here, okay, but not in the, the virus negative uh, cells. But immune cells, you detect the same pattern 
Okay. Then we could figure out, well, is this related uh, to the fact that we use a 10x genomics three prime product to do the single cell sequencing? But in fact, if you use five prime product to do the same thing, you observe exactly the same pattern. So this is not related to the sequencing platform. Okay. And not only you see the detection of viral sequences, you also see detect a co-expression of the immune uh, uh, markers and the virus proteins. And here, uh, we're essentially working with a collaborator. We, we stain the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein here. You can see that the, the, cell, the cell would have the expression of CD3 and the, the, the S protein. So at least in some of cells, you see uh, the, uh, the viral protein and the immune cells. Okay. Um, so, so finally, um, we see, well, do they have any, any, vir any virus receptors? And uh, there are only two well-recognized receptors for the virus. Those are ACE2 and TEMPRAS2. And uh, so these genes are highly expressed in uh, epithelial cells. about cell. one minute left, please. Okay, all right. So not so much in the immune cells. But we, so this is not the reason. But we detect a high expression of alternative or maybe possible uh, 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 receptor like, P, uh, like BSC or N NRP. In fact, the viral load of the BSC is co positive correlated with the expression of BSC. So we don't really know, but this is a one possible explanation. And finally, uh, the virus uh, uh, infected protein tend to have uh, distinct cell-cell uh, -cell interaction patterns, which I don't have time to, to go through. Essentially, this is based on the application of CSO map tool that we, we apply to the uh, virus positive epithelial cells and immune cells, we observed that at least for the squamous um, epithelial cells, when infected, they have, tend to have different infection patterns. They tend to interact with other cells in a stronger fashion. In fact, they seem to recruit macrophage and neutrophil because they tend to have much higher content uh, interaction potential. And such an interaction are predicted to be uh, S108, uh, and this. Um, uh, and uh, A, A and X, A1. So just to summarize, we essentially um, uh, performed a large scale single cell COVID-19 study. And uh, uh, I'm not gonna repeat the findings and maybe I should directly go to the acknowledgement because this is uh, obviously contributed by, by a really lot of people, the, um, many uh, co-authors spanning uh, from 30 different institutions. Here I just show pictures of several individuals in my own lab. Uh, but there's a lot of people to thank for. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for presenting this really comprehensive study of, you know, uh, the very large cohort that you've assembled. Um, our first question uh, actually goes back to the uh, part of your talk about um, the tumor immunology. And Gamal Akabani asks, in solid tumors, in, in solid tumor immune cell populations, uh, there's variation within the different regions, such as necrotic, migrating, and invasive. Is the correlation, presumably the correlation with the myeloid states you've seen based on tumor structure um, or evolution, or is it general? Um, so you know, in this particular study, we uh, did not uh, specifically collect uh, different uh, regions uh, of the tumor, and we essentially have the these are all the treatment naive patients, and um, and um, so we have the primary tumor, and we in some cases we have match the normal adjacent normal samples and blood samples, and um, so uh, we uh, there's no metastatic tumor whatsoever, and uh, there's no different you know, distinction of different sections of the tumor, so so in that case uh, uh, we don't really have answer for this particular question. So this is where we're talking about the general properties. Um, actually, along those same lines, um, I couldn't quite see when you put it up, it was quite quick, uh, whether the it, there's a correlation, you know, different tumors have very different mutational structures, whether that has an influence um, on the immune cell populations that you see for each you know, it's, it, it's a very, very interesting question. We, we try to do that, um, and uh, in our um, uh, uh, report, there is a, for, you know, I think there are several mutations that seem to be correlated. In a, in a very small number of samples, it's really hard to do the correlation between the presence of a specific mutation and the immune subtypes. Because now that we have a fairly large number of, of samples, you can start to do the correlation. Obviously, you have to normalize against the, the preference of the mutation in certain 
uh, these, uh, tumor indication. And um, I, I, I don't have time to go through all the specific those, but those are published in our, in our paper. We actually find some interesting correlations there. Um, and there's actually a question from Alex, so I'll just hand over to you. So, uh, Zemin, excellent, uh, excellent talk and very interesting data. Um, one kind of comment about it is that, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the immune uh, cell subsets don't have the uh, ACE2 uh, and, and temperance receptors doesn't mean uh, they're not necessarily infected. Um, they can be infected by various modes of cell-to-cell -cell spread. So if they're in areas of high infection, it's possible that, you know, the requirement for the, uh, for the receptors is less. That's, that's a very good point, Alex. And in fact, uh, I, I didn't catch, uh, have time to go through the detail. In fact, we're only able to detect the viral signals in those severe patients in their lung region. Because in their lung, uh, sample from the lung, you get the immune cell. Only in those samples, we're able to detect viral signals, but not in either moderate patients or in other blood samples. So that, that's a very strong uh, point, Alex. Thank you for bringing uh, me that up. Great. Thank you again for that brilliant talk, um, but we are at time, so I'm afraid we have to move on now. So um, our third speaker comes yet from another continent. Um, she actually comes from the US, and um, Carly Ziegler is based at Harvard Medical School and MIT in Boston, uh, where she's worked in Alex Schalick's laboratory, and um, the title of her talk is COVID-19 Atlases of the Lung and Nasof Nasopharynx Reveal SARS-CoV-2 Pathology and Cellular Targets. Over to you, Carly. Great. Um, thank you so much. I hope everyone can see my slides. Um, so my name is Carly, and I'm a member of the Shalik Lab. And thank you all for the opportunity to share this data with you. And so today I'm going to present on behalf of a really huge network of collaborators from the Broad, the Reagan Institute, and MIT, and really partnering institutions around the world to show you some of what we've learned about COVID-19 biology in the human respiratory tract. And so around a year ago, multiple research groups discovered that SARS-CoV-2, like previous SARS coronaviruses, uses host ACE2 for cellular targeting and entry and host proteases, including TMPRSS2 for spike protein activation and productive infection. And so one early question that arose was what are the specific tissues and the specific cells that are targeted by SARS-CoV-2? And so there was just an incredible collaboration within the single cell community early last year to leverage published and unpublished atlases of the single cell genomic data and really search for specific cells that express these entry factors. And this allowed us to build a really comprehensive model of SARS-CoV-2 tropism. And so if I focus first on the upper respiratory tract, these presumptive initial targets of viral infection based on ACE2 and other entry factor expression are goblet cells and ciliated cells along the epithelial lining. And these represent some of the very first encounters between our host cells and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we now appreciate the wide diversity of potential outcomes following these initial events. So at one end of the spectrum, some individuals experience mild upper respiratory symptoms that can resolve within a few weeks versus others who display these really prolonged viral loads that lead to severe lung infection and really systemic immune dysfunction. And so today I'm gonna to show you some of our work to really test some of these early predictive models of SARS-CoV-2 tropism by directly analyzing samples from patients with COVID-19 in each of these settings. So from early in the nasopharynx to late disease in the lung parenchyma. And so I'll start with our work to map how SARS-CoV-2 infects the nasal epithelium in humans. And so here we focus essentially on three key questions. What are the direct early targets of viral infection? How do the epithelial and immune cells in the upper respiratory tract respond during infection? And finally, we ask how do the responses relate to whether a patient develops severe disease deeper in the lung or can resolve with a milder course. And so one of our first major tasks was just enabling a sampling strategy of the upper airway. And so we actually found that in addition to sampling nasal viral loads, these standard nasopharyngeal swaps also collect cells from the top epithelial layer of the nasopharynx. And with the correct cryopreservation and processing schemes, we could recover these rare viable epithelial cells that provided a window into host viral interactions at this really critical site of infection. Through collaborations with clinicians at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, we recruited a cohort of around 60 individuals, both healthy and those diagnosed with COVID-19. And we stratified those with COVID by their eventual maximum disease severity from those who resolved with milder forces to people who eventually developed highly severe and critical COVID-19. And so despite relying on vi rare viable cells captured on a swab, 
we were actually able to recover a fairly complete picture of the nasal epithelial environment where we could trace cells along this full developmental trajectory from basal stem cells to fully differentiated multiciliated cell types. And here we actually relied quite heavily on these prior healthy atlases of the upper respiratory tract in humans and model organisms to really annotate and contextualize these findings. And now, so given this level of detail and resolution, we use this to ask how cellular composition differs between healthy and SARS-CoV-2 infected individuals. And so I'll summarize our major findings using the schematic. So first we find really massive expansion and diversification of secretory cells, which is particularly pronounced in those with severe COVID-19. And we validated this in a separate cohort using flow cytometry. Conversely, mature ciliated cells were depleted from secret COVID samples, which is consistent with our assumption that SARS-CoV-2 may directly target these cells, and it also highlights the major loss of this barrier function. And finally, we also see what we think is compensatory repopulation via expansion of some of these ciliated cell intermediates, such as deuterosomal cells. And so next, we also asked if in addition to these major compositional changes, whether individual cells mounted specific responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so I'm gonna focus first on ciliated epithelial cells. So we compared cells from healthy participants shown in blue to those with mild or COVID-19 shown in red. And what you'll notice here is that many of the genes upregulated in mild COVID kind of as we would expect, represent classic interference stimulated or antiviral factors such as MX1 or IF1. And on the bottom here, we've scored for the full type one or type two interference stimulated gene sets really supporting the full induction of this pathway in these cells. When we compared ciliated cells from healthy individuals to those who develop severe disease, we actually only observed partial upregulation of antiviral factors. And when cells from individuals with mild or COVID were compared directly to those in severe disease, we found a major relative defect or a blunting of interferon stimulated gene expression where cells in severe disease really failed to mount this response. And so this wasn't only found in ciliated cells, rather we see this poor induction of interferon stimulated genes among severe samples really across diverse cell types, and in some comparisons, nearly equivalent to cells from healthy samples. We also found that this effect was robust across distinct donors, and so here I'm showing you expression of the transcription factor STAT1, with both, which both induces an antiviral state and is itself an interferon-stimulated gene. And really together, this demonstrates this early defect in the ability of the nasal mucosa itself to induce an antiviral state which is specific to those individuals who go on, who fail to control SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so we next wondered if we could relate these findings to the presence of actual SARS-CoV-2 infected cells within these samples. And if possible, could we pinpoint not only the identity of these infected cells, but also differentiate the cell intrinsic versus the bystander responses to infection. And so as mentioned in the previous talk, so as the SARS-CoV-2 genome is polyadenylated, we reason that we could capture and amplify these viral reads as kind of just another host transcript with our, within our single cell assay. And this turned out to work quite well. So here I'm showing you SARS-CoV-2 aligning UMI per single cell with fairly high viral loads captured among COVID samples. And I'll note that gaining these confident annotations of direct, what we perceive as directly virally infected cells was a really non-trivial task. And so first it required the development of these approaches to first verify the fidelity of capture of viral RNA from single cell genomic methods, which we actually found agree quite well with viral loads measured by standard RT-PCR assays. And we also adopted learning approaches to discriminate between likely intracellular viral RNA and ambient extracellular viral reads that sometimes contaminate these single cell genomics data sets. And finally, we also layered on knowledge of the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle to parse viral reads for those reflective of actively replicating viruses, such as reads that align to the negative sense genome or across these splice regulatory sequences. And so this allowed us to pinpoint the specific subsets of epithelial cells, which represent the most confident targets of SARS-CoV-2 in the human nasopharynx, which are shown here. And so importantly, these infected cell types actually weren't purely predicted by ACE2 expression. So suggesting that there are these other mechanisms that promote or restrict SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I unfortunately won't have time to get into those today. And I'll note that, so using this data, we can now directly ask, what are the other host genes and pathways that are associated with this cell intrinsic response to infection? Meaning, what is the behavior of those specific cells containing viral RNA? And we found that virally infected cells and people who have the mi a milder disease course really robustly induced antiviral genes like MX1, proteocanase R, even higher than uninfected bystanders. But again, these interferon stimulated and antiviral genes were largely absent in virally infected cells in people who went on to develop severe COVID-19. 
And so even in these rare populations of infected epithelia, there appears to be a defect in induction of this pathway. And instead, cells in these donors induce an alternative set of inflammatory genes, such as S100A9, calprotectin, among many others. And together, this opens up a really important question about what mechanisms underlie this inability to mount an antiviral response in the nasal epithelia itself, which is the topic of much of our ongoing work. And so returning to this schematic that I presented earlier, in the last minute or two, I'm gonna highlight some of our work to understand what happens in severe disease in the lung parenchyma itself. And so this project really rapidly came together in early 2020 and through the close co coordination between clinicians and pathologists and computationalists and tissue biologists, we were able to build a sample repository and a collection of genomics and imaging data sets that reflected various tissues from a cohort of individuals who died from COVID-19 at Boston area hospitals. And this was done in collaboration with another group doing really similar work in New York City. And this allowed us to ask these fundamental questions about how the tissue and immune microenvironments are impacted following severe COVID-19 respiratory damage. And so just to give some very high level views of the study, one of the major computational challenges was to rapidly process and annotate this data set. And so to do this, some really amazing computational scientists on this project adapted learning approaches to take existing healthy atlases and quickly annotate new data coming from COVID-19 patients. And they worked closely with experts in respiratory cell biology and immunology to then go validate and fine tune those annotations, really enabling us to make this data available to the community really rapidly. And so in, in comparing this data to match healthy tissues, we found that among many other things, that lung type one and type two pneumocytes were dramatically depleted in COVID-19. And by comparing these lung epithelial cells to prior atlases and diseases such as pulmonary fibrosis, we identified a pathologic expansion of a progenitor cell epithelial cell type in COVID-19, which we think represents a failure of productive type one pneumocyte regeneration. And then finally, as I showed you before with the data from the nasopharynx, we could again connect the identity of each single cell to the presence of intracellular viral reads. And here in the lung, we actually capture very rare infected epithelial cells as they're actually largely depleted from these samples with high viral loads. And rather, the majority of SARS-CoV-2 containing cells in lungs at autopsy are inflammatory lung macrophages. And so this may represent kind of a normal phagocytic role of these cells. But we note that these specific virus-containing macrophages are actually some of the major local sources of inflammatory and chemotactic and profibrotic cytokines within this tissue. And we wonder if they may be part of the development of a hyperinflammatory pathology that's really seen in severe COVID respiratory damage. And so just to quickly summarize, so today I showed you just a small snapshot of what's a large and coordinated effort to understand the impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I highlighted some of the common themes that emerge around epithelial biology and viral tropism. And so we're actively trying to address these other dimensions of this disease, like how this looks at the extremes of age or across different tissues, in which experimental models best recapitulate the diversity of human disease. And so with that, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share this work with you. I'm really one small part of this really huge and collaborative community. And finally, I wanna thank the study participants and their families who have enabled all of this work. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much for yet another great talk. Um, so I maybe I'll start off with a question. So you showed at the end there that you have these myeloid cells that are rich in um, a viral particle. And in you know analogy to the previous talk, uh, do you think these are um, cells that have ingested virally infected cells, or do you believe they're actually uh, cells in which the virus is replicating? Yeah, that's a it's a uh, question that we've puzzled over as well. Um, so. In the studies of the nasopharynx, one of the things that we did, as I mentioned, to kind of start to build a heuristic of what we thought was an actually infected cell was using these subgenomic alignments or negative strand alignments. And we don't see those as much in the macrophages in the lung at autopsy. Um, that's not to say that we just didn't capture them. But as far as kind of a signature of a productively infected cell with high levels of replication intermediates, which were very apparent in the epithelial data from the kind of early nasal swabs, uh, we didn't see them as much in the lung. Great, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky thing to, to tease apart. Um, I also have another question with respect to um, 
this difference you see in the interferon one response that you believe is blunted in severe disease. Um, maybe I just didn't quite catch it, but do you did you also have longitudinal data? So how were you sure that you know you're capturing at the same time point? Because often severe disease is obviously a much further down the line, and you might just be seeing um, a later uh, response in the sort of dynamics of the infection. Yeah, so that's a it's a really important question. And so unfortunately, we didn't have we did not have longitudinal data for this cohort. But what we did was we only included swabs from individuals who are on day one or two of hospitalization, and we controlled them for uh, the stratification of mild versus severe disease was based on their eventual maximum. And all of our donors, at least when they were swabbed, had minimal requirement for say mechanical ventilation. And so they all, at least as a clinical snapshot, looked the same. Um, we certainly want to do that longitudinal cohort. We think it's an incredibly important thing because we have some uncertainty about exactly when, what day following infection these patients really were. Um, but by kind of, by choosing patients that were all within a similar severity at their swab, we attempted to control for that. Great. Excellent. So um, I think there are no further questions um, in the chat at the moment. So, oh, no, there is one from one. Alex. Um, yeah, yeah, just I, I promise it's my last one. I'm not going to interrupt again. Um, so, um, uh, Carly, first of all, uh, just excellent, excellent work. Amazing. Um, so uh, I just wanted uh, kind of to, to, to know, I mean, how did you disentangle the effects of just the amount of virus, uh, differences in the amount of, of the viral load in uh, people that are severely infected, which have usually more virus, uh, from the actual kind of the differences uh, in the cell type, you know, in the, in the host, host cell differences? Yeah, that, no, it's an incredible, it's an important point. We actually found, at least in this snapshot, the abundance of viral reads taken from all of the, from the people who only had a milder course or that went on to develop a severe course, at least at the, you know, static snapshot that we captured, their nasal swabs were all about the same. So we didn't discern any differences between the groups. Um, but we do see an effect if we say, if we correlate cell abundances by the total kind of that snapshot viral load and then in the nose, we do see some effects on cell composition and other factors. Uh, so one example is secretory cell expansion is strongly positively correlated with the total viral load, as is uh, mature ciliated cell depletion. So that makes a little bit of sense if we assume that the virus is really targeting these mature ciliated cells. Um, the interesting part of that that falls apart is even in we expected that interferon stimulated genes would be the key thing to be correlated with viral load, which is really was what was surprising in that all of these severe donors, despite having quite high viral loads at the snapshot, really didn't ex in express any of those uh, any of those genes. And same on the single cell level, we were interested in single cells that had high you know, thousands of uh, viral UMEs versus very few. And similarly, we found a major effect across cohort where severe donors really didn't induce any of these antiviral factors. Great, um, we're at time. So um, I'd just like to thank all the three speakers for their wonderful talks once again. And I will now um, bring the session to a close. Thank you. <laughs>